As he does every Monday throughout the football season, Adam Terry joins us. And, uh, man, Adam, uh, not uh, the most fun game to be down there in person to see uh, on Saturday. Uh, unfortunately, I'd say that that was about uh, one of the main options that could have happened down there. Uh, it's got to be tough to watch uh, seeing Syracuse not really be in it with a chance at all. Yeah, you know, I think the, the most difficult aspect of watching that game is the inability for the offense to put up some points. You know, when you look at what uh, the defense did and, you know, they're, they're up against it when you have uh, the offense has the inability to, to, you know, put up first down. So, you know, when you're, when you're looking at what it is and, yes, it's a high-scoring affair where they're putting up 40 on you, but uh, I think the thing that we've got to look at is, you know, where is that offense right now? Um, where is the production? And you've got 10 days right now. How do you right those wrongs? How do you get prepared to go down to Virginia Tech? And this is, you're out of that gauntlet period. You're out of that uh, high-end uh, opponent. And now you have the ability to basically be where, uh, this is my opinion, be where they where I expected them to be, mm-hmm. you know, four and three. And now you have five games left to dictate whether or not you're going to make a bowl. And also not just to make a bowl, but is it a warm weather bowl or is it a, is it a cold weather climate where everybody's out there in hats and gloves? Uh, yeah, uh, all that still to be determined. And you're right. Like the season set up very strangely with kind of the three distinct sections of, you know, getting it going, the three hardest games in a row, and then a, a doable home stretch here, which we're, we're entering. I, I wonder what you think, Adam, or, or do you have to wait and see? Do, do you think, you know, these offensive woes the last three weeks, is it more the opponent that the Orange were playing, you know, in Clemson at least a big-time D and then two big-time teams in Carolina and Florida State? Or, or are you seeing legitimate issues that are worries right now? I think the one issue that you see the most is you don't have that go-to guy. You know, Rondé Gadsden getting hurt early in the season. He was the security blanket, I think, for Jared Schrader. When in doubt, throw it up, whether it's a double team or um, whether he's in being bracketed or, you know, uh, there's a swarm to the football. You knew that Rondé with his size could go up and pick that ball up out of the air. And that was probably seven times out of ten. Uh, this year they don't have that, and when the ball is thrown and uh, it hits wide receivers in the hands, I think that has to be extremely frustrating not only for Garrett Schrader but also for Jason Beck because even if the play call is well and the ball is delivered, there's still uh, that one eleventh out on the field that is you know disappointing the team. So <clears throat> there's a lot of one-on-one battles, and it's a team effort, um, but. You know, individuals have to step up in order for Syracuse to actually progress um, to have a winning season and also make a bowl game. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned Gadsden. Obviously, Gadsden's the, the biggest uh, loss as he was a, a true one. You talk about Dino Babers, consistently good, occasionally great. Uh, Gadsden was both of those. <laughs> like, he was always there and then uh, occasionally made the spectacular. But, you know, without him, uh, Zay Jones was working his way in, uh, back in last week, but didn't have a catch. Trevor Pena's uh, been gone the whole season. You're basically missing right now, you know, in many ways, three of your top four guys. Is that what's most noticeable? You know, guys are, uh, guys are kind of playing out of out of position of having to be the one, two, three guys where at least at the moment, maybe they're better suited to being the, you know, the three, four, five guys in the rotation there. Oh, I, I think uh, guys are, guys are stepping up, but not to the extent that everybody would like, you know, there's, there's opportunities where a guy like Damon Alford has a spectacular catch, but you know, over the past three games has dropped, um, you know, somewhat routine, you know, nothing's routine, but when it hits you in the hands and nobody's in front of you, that, that to me is a routine catch. And then Yamari Hatcher and Donovan Brown, they flash the, that brilliance, but they're still relatively young. Um, and that's not necessarily in the classroom, but on the field, they're relatively young. Um, and, you know, they have to find their way. We can be negative throughout this whole thing, but the, the, the one positive that I saw through uh, through this game was LaQuint Allen. Yeah. You know, we, we understood what a talent he was, you know, being the Gatorade State Player of the Year out of New Jersey, which is a tremendous feat. Um, he played with a, a, a ton of physicality. 
you know, before I thought he was that, that back out of the backfield that, you know, could catch, you know, could get outside on an edge and run the football. But what we saw this week is he's a, he's a complete back. And uh, it was really fun to watch once that offensive line, there were spurts there that they looked very good and they were knocking people off of the ball. Jason Beckett schemed it up well to get two, two backs in the backfield, which created a little bit of a mismatch for the defense. But, you know, to watch LaFont Allen dissect and not even just dissect the defense, but, you know, he got the ball and went downhill and smacked the linebacker and knocked him back. That, that to me was impressive. So, you know, I think there's some woes on that offensive side, but the, the one thing that I, I took away from this was um, the ability for LaQuint Allen to be a all-around back, and if he continues to bre- progress, he's going to be a guy nationally everybody has to take account for. Yeah, LaQuint, Adam, he ended up 19 carries, uh, a buck 10, and, you know, he was going along. It was about three and change a carry in the first half, but it was always falling forward, and then he busted a couple uh, in the second half, which, uh, I mean, those directly correlate. He also had three catches and, and 16 yards. So what do you think is Adam Terry is our guest? You know, we kind of saw the last two years with Sean Tucker, you know, that there is a game plan, right, when you have a lead back that can be uh, the guy. We, we saw what Allen did this week. We've seen the woes elsewhere on the offense the last three weeks. Do you, do you start shifting maybe more toward trying to lean on LaQuint here in the next few weeks until uh, the rest of it can come along? I, I think what you've seen is, you know, when you start to do that, you have to be a balanced attack. And I think that's what Syracuse has the weapons and capability to do is be a balanced attack. And when you start to lean too heavily on Garrett to move the football, um, you can see that that pressure starts to mount and there's some some follies that occur, you know, whether that's holding on to the ball a little bit too long or trying to make something happen and that ball pops loose like we saw this week. Um, you know, you have to have the ability to throw the ball when you need to throw, the ability to run the ball when you need to run it, and those are individual approaches on the outside, but also that offensive line has to continue to, to progress and um, take a game over. Well, you know, what you saw out of Florida State offensive line, which to me is the main reason that they're being more successful, that offensive and defensive line for Florida State, mm-hmm. um, was just the fact that you can take that game over in the third and the, the bottom of the third and going into the top of the fourth quarter where you can just ground and pound. And if you need to, you, you rotate backs in and uh, – That is the recipes for success that we've seen nationally, right? Like you can throw it deep and you can, you can spin it around, but you've also got to have the ability to run the football when that time comes to shorten the game. Yeah. And I think we saw, right. The, the orange defense, the orange defense was more than well representative for what, two two and a half quarters or so. Uh, Do you think that's what it was down the stretch Adam? you know, in a game like that, that the defense just gets worn down by, you know, that constant pressure from Florida state. Yeah, you get worn down, right? You're out on the field a, a significant amount of time. And, you know, you look at, uh, you know, I don't know. It's, it's difficult to say because, you know, Syracuse won the time of possession battle, right? right? So when you're, when you're looking at it, they won the time of possession battle, but it was also um, when they decided to run the football, uh, Florida State was able to run the football. And, we're really in it until that big double move by um, Keon Coleman on the outside on Isaiah Jones and or uh, Isaiah Johnson. And I think, you know, that one was a little bit of a dagger and, and took the wind out of the, the sails for Syracuse because prior to that, they had only given up that big, deep, uh, that big, deep shot to Coleman earlier. So, you know, they were in it, they were in it, they were in it. And then, as the game starts to wear on, if there's no offensive production, you know, it's, it's tough to go out there as that defense and, and, uh, you know, battle, battle again, zero points up on the board. Yeah, I'd say, Adam, uh, you hit on a guy. My, my, my main takeaway from watching that football game on Saturday, Ke- Keon Coleman's really good, huh? <laughs> like, he's spectacular. Well, the thing about Keon Coleman that impresses me the most is he moves like he's 5'10", 6'4". Yeah. You know, he's a 6'4 wide receiver that when he took that punt return, you're like, okay, oh, okay, oh, okay. 
And, you know, he was able to, to maneuver through um, a very good punt cover unit for Syracuse. So I, I just, I, you know, these are first round picks that you're talking about. Um, whether that's Johnny Wilson, the other wide receiver who didn't play. Um, oh, thankfully, he didn't play. Yeah. And, you know, Keon Coleman out there. And when you mix in what they have in the backfield with Jordan Travis, I don't know how he projects or where he projects. Um, probably a mid to a little bit later. But then, you know, throwing the mix with Trey Benson and a, a plethora of, of running backs there, like, that's a, it's a solid football team. And, um, if they continue down the road, you know, Syracuse is able to play against a, a potential um, playoff caliber team. So, you know, that's what they've experienced right now is Clemson is down, but Clemson is still Clemson. Mm-hmm. UNC is on the rise. And then a team like Florida State is back. It's just a matter of do they win enough games to get themselves into the show. Adam Terry with us. Uh, handicap the league a little bit here, Adam. Who, who impressed you more? Because I, I think we just saw the two best in the league. Who, who impressed you more, Carolina or Florida State? Uh, I'm, I'm with Florida State right now. Um, Florida State is just one where I think they have the backing and the support of the alums and the former players and they've been there and done that and there's some uh, ability for players to reach out and talk about you know the glory days I guess you know when we were down there they brought the 93 national championship team out on the field and you could tell that everybody in the stands had talked to their children about the glory days of Florida State and that's kind of when it started um North Carolina, you've seen them be strong, but they just don't have that history of of what Florida State does. So, you know, when I look at it, I think Florida State just has the backing and and everybody's bought back into supporting Florida State. UNC is still um, blazing that trail, and they're blazing that trail into, you know, can we turn the tides um, like Mac Brown had started prior to leaving for Texas? You know what, Adam? They had a note. I think it was RG3 had a note on the TV broadcast, and this goes to what you're saying. that uh, Jordan Travis apparently has weekly calls with Charlie Ward and Jameis Winston, who are both national championship winning quarterbacks out of there. That, like, that's a pretty cool right uh, through the years thing with that program going on right now. And, you know, um, Charlie Ward is probably a, a great resource. Jameis Winston, who knows? Who knows what he's talking about? <laughs> he's eating, he's eating um, them know, W's. I don't know what he's doing. He's eating W's right now. But it is that uh, it is that depth and the knowledge and just a sounding board. How do you? Sometimes the hardest thing is how do you deal with success? You know, it's 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 tough when you're trying to build a program, a, a program like Syracuse, and you're trying to come back and relive the quote unquote glory days. But that's a long time ago. Um, you know, not to say that Florida State's reign isn't that long ago, but it's uh, it's much closer than when, when Syracuse was very relevant. Um, but the hardest thing is being on that campus and dealing with the success and with Jordan Travis and what he had talked about when they brought Mackenzie Milton in in the early days of the Mike Norvell era. Yeah. How did he deal with the losing? You know, he was going to give up the sport, and now to see where he is, you know, four or five years later with the support of the alums, that is a a fantastic thing. So, you know, you've got the alums talking about um, supporting Jordan Travis and, and, and hoping that they do well. And, you know, ours are calling out, you know, Hey, let's, let's get, get us off national TV broadcast. So that's the, that's the hard part of, of where the, the difference of the, um, programs are right now yeah adam terry with us and uh let's hit a little garrett schrader here you know dino mentioned after the game uh, apparently garrett had some food poisoning uh, the day before I- i'm going to take it even back to that hit or to basically start the clemson game i don't know if he's uh looked uh, quite right since then H- how important uh for garrett is just a few days here <laughs> you know a few days to regather uh before attacking this uh back five games of the year I mean, it's huge. You know, I, I think he is, uh, he's pressing and not necessarily on the field, but he's a guy that wants to win. And, um, you know, one of the statements that was brought to light after the UNC game was just how guys weren't prepared. Right. So um, 
I think that came out in in one of the national publications about um, how guys weren't ready and guys weren't prepared for the game. And and right now you've got 10 days to reinstitute. For some of these guys, they don't know what it is to prepare, right? That's on the coach. You know, that's on the individual position coach and the leadership within the unit. Um, But I, I look at it and start to say, you know, he's going to be ready. He's going to be prepared. He's going to fight through anything. It's just a matter of, is there a point where you can get him to almost relax and calm down? Uh, and that's just an observation from the outside looking in from nine stories up in Dope Campbell Stadium. But you can tell he's, he's geared up and he's ready to compete. Um, can they put him in a situation where he can uh, decompress a little bit and, and be able to distribute the ball with guys picking up the slack? Uh, yeah. Adam was very high up on uh, on Saturday. That was, uh, that was a far way up. You guys get to watch the game uh, from there. <laughs> All right, man. Well, we'll save the Virginia Tech talk, I, I think, till next Monday. Uh, and next time you'll be, uh, you'll be getting ready for Ender Sandman and the whole thing down in Blacksburg. But uh, thanks as always. Uh, enjoy the bye week, and we'll talk next Monday. All right? 